Welcome to the fifth uh, seminar in our Miller and Sawyer seminar series for, the, for this uh, academic year. Um, our theme is democratic citizenship and the recognition of cultural differences. And we're taking up a series of hard questions uh, concerning um, recognizing cultural differences, um, accommodating them, tolerating them, depending on your favorite term there, which you would has different connotations. It's interdisciplinary, and we're discussing um, how um, within democratic societies, rather than mostly uh, globally, how uh, we can um, extend um, a recognition and more than toleration, perhaps, celebration, to cultural differences while still retaining commitments to uh, human rights, women's human rights, a secular public sphere, and uh, equality. So um, that's our general theme. I would, uh, we're excited today to have a distinguished speaker and an incisive commentator. Um, I would like to just briefly thank um, the co-directors of the uh, seminar, Ruth O'Brien, Omar Gabor, and Richard Wallen. And um, we able to um, bring together wonderful Mellon faculty fellows and student fellows who've been uh, attending um, more or less regularly, which is great. Um, and I would like to thank Chase Robinson, who is here today, for his support for the uh, project. And of course, our executive officers, uh, Jakobo Siliu and Joe Rollins. Um, so today, I would like to introduce uh, our speaker, and then I will wait and introduce a commentator uh, afterwards. I want to um, remind you of our um, procedure, which is we'll have the talk and the commentary. We'll then take a five minute break. Um, hopefully we can wait till after the commentary for a break. Then we're gonna have discussion among those present. We are taping um, all of the proceedings, so we have to ask you to stand up and talk into the mic, or we'll go around with a handheld mic for your questions. So you can be heard both on the Center for Global Ethics and Politics website, as well as the Mellon website, as well as iTunes University. Uh, so this particular event is co-sponsored by our Center for Global Ethics and Politics, which um, deals with all kinds of transnational democracy, human rights, global justice, issues like that, and ethical issues of globalization. So, with all that said, I'm really delighted to have our very distinguished speaker, Abdullahi Anayin, today, whose work I've um, had the privilege of teaching in some of my classes. He uh, is really the foremost uh, proponent of um, human rights within Islam and, and especially women's human rights, um, which has been such a very important and creative work over the years. Um, he's Charles Howard Candler, Professor of Law, Director of the Center for International and Comparative Law at Emory University School of Law in Atlanta, and also Associate Professor in the Emory College of Arts and Sciences, Senior Fellow at the Center for the Study of Law and Religion at Emory. Is that all? Yeah. Okay. Um, and uh, he has uh, recently uh, received um, a series of awards I've just mentioned, the James Wells and Johnson Medal for 2011 for Human Rights, um, and also the Tanner Lectures on Human Values at the University of California, Berkeley, on the theme, Transcending Imperialism, Human Values, and Global Citizenship. The list of his books is enormous. I'll take a deep breath and just mention a few. Um, let's see, Human Rights and Cross-Cultural Perspectives was an early one. Cultural Transformation and Human Rights in Africa in 2002, Islamic Family Law in the Changing World. Um, those were all edited, but the authored ones include um, Toward an Islamic Reformation, Civil Liberties, Human Rights and International Law in 1990. Another one was African Constitutionalism and the Role of Islam in 2006, Islam in the Secular State in 2008, a very influential book, and Muslims and Global Justice in 2011. And most recently, I'm happy to say that his um, book, What is an American Muslim, is uh, forthcoming uh, from Oxford University Press. He's completed it, and it will be out recently soon. Uh, 
soon, so we're excited about that. Uh, his talk today is based on that book and is entitled Beyond Minority Politics, American Muslims and Citizenship. Thank you for coming up with the uh, good afternoon and thank you for, for being here and it's a privilege to uh, be part of this uh, seminar. And uh, the, the book that I'm going to present uh, an outline is quite different from what I used to do before. I mean, it's, uh, basically, all the work I did uh, since I was a young law teacher in Sudan in the early 80s and since I left Sudan in the middle 80s uh, is personal. Always be personal. And I, I, I do admit up front um, the opening that I am very much into advocacy for social change. I don't believe in scholarship for scholarship's sake. I believe that it has to be good scholarship to be useful. But I'm very explicit that the scholarship I try to do is do in terms of trying to transform as a Muslim myself from Sudan and as a global citizen, I would say also that I try to engage this question a very personal matter. Uh, the work I did was so far has been more in the international and especially African or Islamic. But this one is about American Muslims. Because I've come finally to become an American Muslim. So I'm actually an African American Muslim. An African who became an American who is a Muslim. But also uh, I think also the first time we know that our children are American, our grandchildren are American. And that is how I came to this idea of what it means to be an American Muslim. And uh, the, the, the idea that came to me about that, uh, I guess the book tried, sort of like writing the book to uh, the manuscript to build around it, is this notion of being minority politics. Uh, that personally, as, as I said, uh, I'm thinking, yes, I'm an American, I'm a Muslim, but uh, that's not all of me. I mean, there is much to me than being a Muslim or being an American Muslim. But politically, I have my views, positions, socioeconomically, uh, uh, in all sorts of ways. So uh, the idea, the core idea is that uh, identities are multiple, are overlapping, are contingent, negotiated, uh, and that we all have multiple identities, and we all sort of negotiate in terms of how to affirm which one in what setting and in relation to what else. And that, that is very much a relation, relational uh, also a sense of identity. I, I must admit that I have no training in social science. I'm a lawyer all through and through. All the most training I had, uh, if you call it that, was, was, a, was a lawyer. But, so, but I came to issues of maybe anthropological, sociological, some of you say maybe political uh, philosophy ideas I came to as a human rights lawyer. Uh, so the idea of this notion that identity, uh, being a Muslim, does not exhaust who I am. And uh, maybe it, it can inform an important way is, uh, how I engage the, the issues of social policy, of, of, of social justice, and so on, but it does not really uh, exhaust who I am. And that American Muslims are not just simply a monolithic anything. I mean, there are such variety of cultural, uh, ethnic, uh, socioeconomic background and experience that really to lump all American Muslims together as one entity is really very uh, misleading and, and not very helpful. So uh, building out of that, I mean, the first chapter of the book tries to uh, present um, a, a notion of uh, identity as multiple, as contingent, as overlapping, as relational, as I said, in the sense that uh, very much uh, it is not simply up to me, it is up to me in relation to others. And whatever identity I seek to, to affirm or to present uh, is really my claim as seen or reacted to by others. It is not something that are established by just simply affirming it or accepting it. And therefore, being able or being in a position to, to, to engage in that negotiation is part of the process of affirming uh, multiple identities that we have as a lawyer, as a human rights uh, activist, as a father, a grandfather, and as a political 
person what to do, but recently voted in the current or recent elections, uh, successfully, I should say. So, <laughs> so I'm all of that. Uh, so how come that being Muslim is everything that I am or nothing else? And I know that there are many Muslims who may not have gone to the way I did. I'm sure, I'm sure some do not. And that some are not uh, in, in the social thinking, are not uh, you know, similar to them that I am, and so on. So th that is the thinking. Then in chapter 2, uh, and again, I came to realize this, I started working on this book. Uh, I present uh, an overview of the experiences of other religious communities in this country and how they have negotiated identity and struggled with similar issues over time. Catholics, Mormons, the Jews, uh, the three cases that I look at, but also in terms of more broadly, um, uh, the way American citizenship has been defined by history and experience. Now, often when I, when I was presenting about this and trying to argue for it at various stages, uh, we would tend to assume that I take American notion of citizenship as ideal or as perfect or as, uh, in any sense, uh, complete. I, I think we have it all here, all that we need to have. And there is nothing uh, really further from the truth. I see the idea as very much a product of history, of political struggles and contestations, and that is a very, very long way to go. And that basically it is affirming the, the possibility of contesting what it is and transforming what it is, that again and underpins this project. So to say that, yes, I'm an American citizen, but that itself is not also exhausted by current understanding of what that means or by historical experiences of what that has been. And that I have to present um, a very uh, sort of, uh, I mean, I have to commit to the principle in order to contest it, it makes that a make a difference and that I have to be able to engage in uh, alliances and uh, sort of solidarities that enable me to do that. Uh, and part of the notion of uh, uh, the idea of, of uh, beyond minority politics is very much about uh, the ability to negotiate and to uh, build alliances and to, 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 to be part of that process of constructing what uh, citizenship can mean. But actually, I, I meant to start, and um, I hope it's not too late to do that already, by three narratives, three stories that I think, which are all personal, they all happen to me personally, and all at least I interact with them in a personal way. And I think that they both explain uh, the problematic that I'm grappling with, and its difficulty, and its uh, really ambiguity also, and so on. And I'll just tell the stories and then see, uh, say what I see in them, and also eventually maybe we will discuss them in the discussion time. The first story is uh, a report actually that uh, Margot Badran, some of you may know her name, she's an American scholar, historian, I think, who wrote about uh, Muslim or Islamic citizen uh, feminism. And, uh, she, she wrote a story about, that was published in the Ahram Week in Cairo, about that, obviously, it wasn't by accident that she had to be in that big Muslim mosque on, uh, in, in, on uh, Embassy Row in Washington, D.C., the one with the dome and the high minaret, and that she had to be there when a group of Muslim women came in a bus, like a, in a demonstration, to the mosque, and demanded to be allowed into the mosque and they wanted to go into the main prayer space in the mosque. And obviously they were making a point about the exclusion of women uh, from that prayer space. Uh, even if the women, if they are allowed into the mosque, are often into a basement or uh, into a closed off room somewhere in some corner. But they wanted, they demanded to get have access. And the and obviously that the, the event was planned because obviously the, 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 the chair of the board of the mosque had to be there also and he objected to their going in and he called in the police and the police uh, told him he is right, you can't go in, if you he says that you can't go in. That we as police, we can, we can not really help to uh, break the law by allowing you to, uh, to, 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 to 
violate uh, the board's authority in terms of controlling who, who comes into the mosque and which part of the mosque they go to. And so she was commenting on the irony of it that the, police, the American police in Washington, D.C. would deny women access to a religious space uh, in the name of protecting freedom of women. Because uh, there is a kind of freedom of religion issue that uh, American court, American law does not really sanction um, sort of uh, state uh, sort of what's known as um, almost like the, the idea of meddling in or uh, going into the controversial question about doctrine, religious doctrine and how communities organize themselves and so on. So that was what was true. The second story happened to be um, a personal, a very uh, sad and painful event. It was a burial uh, sort of ceremony in Atlanta that um, a friend of ours um, um, they, they had a daughter who was, uh, she had a very severe Down syndrome and uh, all her life she was totally dependent on her mother to feed her, to do all the basic uh, services to her, uh, to help her with that. And eventually she died of the complications to do with her uh, medical condition. And, and here comes the question of community. What is a community and how, what, what do you need? What, what do you need a community for? And so on. so when, when, when a treatment, when this happens, people start calling, I mean, that's what we do in Sudan, Sudanese uh, around Atlanta, is you call people up and you explain that this happened and people come. Even people who hardly you know the, the people in the family or very, very much, they would also come and people organize and they conduct uh, the, all the services that need to happen as a group, and then we take the, the, the body to the cemetery, a Muslim cemetery, which is designated as such, uh, in order for, for the burial to happen. And when we went there, uh, I was standing next to the father right by the left side, and the men were engaged in the process of digging up the grave and preparing the body for burial, and the mother was, with other women, were kept almost like about uh, a quarter of a mile or half a mile away. And I uh, just started having to look and see that they were clustered down the mother and they were all crying and she was crying and in this place to stay. But she was not allowed to come closer to the burial site. And when I, when I asked what happened, they said the man shouted in their face and they were trying to approach that women are not allowed here. And um, I told you that lost it. I mean, like, lost it in the, in the bad sense. And I said that I didn't speak up. I didn't say anything. I was just feeling shame and feeling anger and frustration that this should be, that the person who was the most deserving of being part of that scene and that fight was the one who was denied being there just because she was the woman. But I didn't speak up. And to me, both aspects are two sides of the same coin of what is wrong with us and Muslim communities. That, we are, that this happens and that we are allowed to happen. Because, I mean, it doesn't happen by itself and it doesn't happen and we wouldn't have it if we didn't allow it to happen. So that also is, is the, the second narrative. The third narrative is different but also not that different in the sense that also it has some direct similarity. Uh, a former student of mine in the law school, she contacted me one time and said that the sister of her husband wanted to marry a Christian man. And the family were opposed to that. Because a Muslim woman is not allowed to marry a Muslim man. Whereas a Muslim man can marry a Christian woman. Uh, and that the, the, the young woman was determined to marry him and that she was determined not to ask him to go through the the pretense of converting to Islam in order to fulfill the requirement. Because what happens usually is when a Muslim woman wants to marry a non-Muslim person, the person will declare shahada as a professor of the faith, uh, and they will say, okay, now he's a Muslim, now we can go ahead and get, uh, have their marriage. But in fact, it wouldn't be a real conversion, but it was just simply to satisfy the requirement. And, and the young student somehow seemed to have remembered that I had expressed an opinion in class that actually there is no basis for that discrimination between men and women on this issue. There are other aspects of Sharia where there are spiritual basis for discrimination, but on this one there was none. 
because the relevant persons do not speak in terms of gender difference. Uh, when it says you are not allowed to marry unbelievers, it doesn't say you men or you women. So it applies equally to both. But unbelievers are not people of the book who are unbelievers. So in any case, I had argued for that position. I, I wrote about it in an introduction to the book of Muslim uh, sort of Islamic family law in a general world. Uh, so she called on me to her for help. And so I gave a photo. I went to the family and I said, actually, there is no scripture basis for this uh, blocking this marriage, and it is possible to have it. And I gave a short speech and recited the Quran. And in any case, it was a situation where I was able to intervene in a way that made a difference. I think the family also was in crisis in that they needed a way out. They needed a way of. Because the girl was determined to marry the man and was determined not to force him to bed uh, just to fulfill the requirement. Uh, and um, so, anyway, the, fortunately, the marriage, the Muslim marriage, the marriage was concluded. And then again, the next day, married him in a Christian ceremony, and uh, hopefully, they will be happy ever after. Uh, now, these three stories, uh, I, I bring them here to say one is how fragile and how politically important the notion of community is. That uh, it is something that we can't fake, and it is something that we can't force. It has to be spontaneous. And it has to be something that we want to be part of, and it performs very valuable service to us in the sense of anchoring us in our lives and supporting us in critical moments of our lives when we have a community. Because I mean that, what would you do if, uh, if you live in a place where there is no community around you, when you have a suffer a grief and all that, and like the poor and so on, the lost man do that. And what would you do even in terms of performing the rituals of burying? Uh, and we are all raised to the believers from me that we have to keep ties with our community and we have to respect our communities for our lives because when we need them, we will find them. And there is no substitute whatsoever for community when you need it. Because it's fine when you are young and healthy and uh, sort of running around, but when you, when you are sick, when you are suffering a bereavement in your very close family, that's when you need community. And that's when you must have invested for the community to be able to have it. In Sudan, we have a, 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 a story or a proverb that says, you can't feed your donkey only when you need to ride it. Excuse that. It sounds very odd. What do I do? You can't feed your donkey only when you need to ride it. Meaning that you have to keep your friend donkey, you call it horse, call it cow, uh, well fed or well maintained all the time so that when you need it, you'll find And similarly with this community, you have to invest in your community all the time so that when you need it, you'll that's the point I see. The second point is also about precisely because of what the community is supposed to be and how it's supposed to support us in, in our moments of need. It has to be able to keep uh, sort of abreast with transformation in our lives. That I cannot be saved in all the ways I need my community to save me if the life I live is not the life I used to be. That the, the our previous community may have been able to support. Now, American Muslims happen to be, I think I'll suggest, uh, I know that every time of generalization is going to be problematic and going to be protesting, but I think there is a significant difference between African American Muslims and uh, Muslims of immigrant background, um, with the, with whatever part of the Muslim world that they come from. Not that either community is homogeneous. But there is a significant difference in the following sense. In the sense that African American Muslims are indigenous Americans. So they, they have a, a cultural roots and memory and experiences that won't receive their beings as a community. And that there, uh, I would also uh, sort of presume to suggest that. Uh, when they converted to Islam and given communities of African American Muslims, they bring a, bring a lot of the African American Christian experience 
into the Muslim communities. So that uh, the, the commitment to social justice, the ability to provide essential services to the community. So the, 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 the organic and vibrant nature of the communities, I think, drives from that uh, type of history and experience. Uh, in contrast, I think uh, Muslims of immigrant uh, background, even in their second and generation Muslims, still they tend to have an, an imaginary of community as something of the old country, something that they grew up with in India or in Pakistan or in West Africa or in, uh, in the Middle East. And therefore, they, they, they tend to have a, a romantic but also unrealistic notion of the community. And I think that that, that that sort of imaginary of uh, community that, that is no longer really uh, uh, is has not really adapted to even the concept or the, the feeling or the idea of it has not yet adapted to uh, the type of, of, of experience that Muslims, uh, immigrant Muslims, are having in urban settings. I mean that, that communities that we grew up with are very locally sort of anchored. Uh, in the sort of close limit, but in, in, in spatial terms, in interpersonal terms, that are no longer possible to sustain in this country. Uh, and yet, we, so, so in Atlanta, we, we are sort of like a couple of thousand or so Muslim people of, of, of Sudanese origin uh, think of ourselves as a community. So when we have a bereavement, we call each other, we call them together. We don't call other Africans, we don't call other so-called Arabs to, to, to be part of, of our community in that moment, but we call each other. Despite our coming from very different parts of Sudan, despite our having very little to do with our lives in Sudan as we used to have them, and somehow we mimic, I think. Uh, uh, this is the point that I think so far we have been able to mimic what our old country design of community used to be, um, able to carry it through, but I don't think that we can do this for long. And I think that we have to reinvent our communities. And we have, therefore, we have to come to terms with that if we want to have physical, spatial dimension to it, it has to be on different terms and be to the need of the and so on. But those are the types of issues I struggle with in this manuscript. Now, I think that the, 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 one of the core issues that I also understand now having done this work and work on it, and still I hope I'll be able to do more of it, is the very profound anxiety people have about loss of community. Uh, uh, by that, by, uh, I mean the people that I know, I mean, Muslims of uh, immigrant background and so on, that we worry that this is something that's so fragile and so delicate and, and contingent that if we mess with it, if we try to, to try to do uh, things with it too much, we might totally around it. And, 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 and uh, I think that the, the, the deep fear is a fear of what will we do if we lost it? Uh, how can we have a coherent life? How can we celebrate our holidays? How can we uh, congregate for our reasons? How can we even sometimes materially support each other when we need to? that there is a bond we will want to keep. But that bond, I think, uh, we may be able to have kept it so far by almost like willpower. Just simply, but we need you to stay with me. Be part of this. And we call each other on holiday with the Eid. A couple of weeks ago, we went visiting each other. It happened to be lucky in the weekend. So now, uh, of course, I mean, all of this is, is new and different for us. but. We try to, to, to create a sense of continuity. Uh, but if we lost it, if we... So for me, as I engage in this project, uh, I'm driven by a feeling that for my children, for my grandchildren, I need to do something about this. That, that our community has to change for it to be able to, be able to stay the same. You know that, that very profound step. You know, I tend to quote the movies, I hope you don't mind. I can't even remember. I think that the movie was called The Labor. It was Bert Lack, ah, this was long before the time. Bert Lack is still a political denali. Uh, and it was about Sicily. And uh, the Bert Lack character was a prince uh, 
سيسل المقابل لذلك المشي and he had a piece with uh, what we say that we were invented and the piece was theorizing and theologizing for him all his misdemeanors and, uh, and violations and so on but at some point the priest so sometimes the priest speak the truth and know religious uh, lyrics and so he, had to, he said to, to, to the prince you know your highness things have to change in order to stay the same and I think community has to change in order to stay the same. Uh, for us to be able to claim it and to find what we need it, uh, it has to change. But when we strike a change, we strike in a very arbitrary manner. I don't really know what to do. And the problem is that the nature of the what it is that we do is we can only find out after the fact. It is not something that we can say and provide it down and then go and come back and change it. Once you say it in public and it, it, it is carried out in people's experiences, conversations and so on, you can't call it back, you can't negate uh, what you said and so on. So that what me. Uh, and I'm being very candid and open to say that it's a project that I engaged in out of commitment to the secular spirit, out of commitment Secular space, as Gaudi said, uh, uh, democratic uh, transformation, uh, cultural pluralism, all these ideas that we write and think about. But when it comes to our personal lives and the risks we take, what if uh, in doing what I do, I damage uh, the, the coherence, the integrity of community as I need it to be? without really quite being quite clear what the government is and how to make it. Now there are other issues that I would, I would also bring in in case we uh, really have time to discuss is uh, the similarities and differences of Muslims uh, versus other religious communities experiencing in this country. Because in, in, in the in chapter two I think of uh, that I did the, the overview of other experiences, uh, there was something different about them. I mean they were all of European Caucasian background, so they were not visibly as familiar, sort of as minority as Muslims are. And the Muslims who come, uh, immigrant Muslims or African American Muslims, are visibly different. And therefore, is that difference going to make a difference in terms of how they can negotiate their identity and their religious experiences in this country, uh, or will they be able to carry on? Uh, or, or, or have to transform in different ways. But also that uh, a lot of the experiences that we bring over are experiences of the old country with, with the problems of the old country. Now, Atlanta has about nine or 12 million mosques, and each one of them is ethnically defined in terms of who goes there. The Somalis go to some mosques, the uh, Arabs go to other mosques, the Pakistanis go to, uh, and so on. And, and I understand that the other uh, religious communities tend to go also to be based on church uh, membership and, and, and tenders also tend to be ethnic sometimes. But I think in a different way, probably. But in any case, that, that aspect has to change because you can't really go around sort of I mean, from one end of town to the other just to go for the mosque. But, but what about the rest of the life of the community that you think you are part of? So that there are many issues. One of them, that what is me somewhat is, it's going to take several generations for Muslim experiences to integrate fully in the mainstream of this, uh, this country's institutions. Because I think that uh, it's one thing to say that, uh, and I don't believe that we, we just simply said, uh, it's not like um, a share that we take or put on another share, that we, we don't uh, lose uh, many of the aspects of our identity and culture by living in a different environment and trying to struggle with different kinds of uh, issues. But there are ways in which, uh, in particular, the judicial uh, uh, institutions, that the pillars of this country, uh, I think in terms of religious experience and so on, is, uh, is the first amendment, uh, the, 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 the notion of separation of religion and the state on the one hand and free exercise of religion on the other. And that American courts have engaged in, uh, through a very 
protracted and uh, difficult and sometimes quite uh, problematic uh, sort of way of trying to negotiate how can the state keep this or how can institutions and American law and so on keep this balance between freedom of religion and freedom of religion or free exercise and, and separation of religion and state. But the thinking and the level of, I mean, the sensibility of American judges are of the same communities as those who are struggling with these questions in religious terms. It's going to be a long time before Muslims' sensibilities are integrated at that level. So maybe a question to the seminar team is, uh, what do you do to that dimension of, well, because I mean, you can have, with the best of intentions, you can have a commitment to pluralism, a commitment to acceptance and celebration of difference, but still difference is too real sometimes to, to just be content with that. I mean that uh, we cannot accelerate the process whereby, uh, and we cannot really expect it to be realistically achievable that a tiny uh, number of people, I don't like to call it minority, because I was just arguing against that, but three or four billion people can have an impact on a 300 million population in a way that, uh, and by Muslim sensibilities, I don't mean that Muslims have uniform sensibilities by virtue of being Muslim, but, but there are some aspects of uh, intuitive thinking, of, of a sense of fairness and a sense of balance, things that you can't quite define in precise language. Uh, but, but all of that goes into uh, sort of poor adjustment calls that judges make about what is appropriate, what is the, the line between public space and private space, between like those police officers who had to send Muslim women away from the mosque in Washington because they were intruding on. Now, uh, one of the major aspects of, of the book that I highlight is. I believe that Islam is inherently, not only just simply historically or sociologically speaking, but inherently opposed by the idea of institutionalization of religion. That uh, I think I say that sometimes that I think Islam is fundamentally radically theologically democratic, even when Muslims tend to be uh, sometimes sociologically seeking to try to. So the, the fact that you can never abdicate this possibility. You can never create uh, an activity or a process whereby Sharia can be declared or Sharia doctrine can be changed by, by the statement or the position that a clerical congregation or a council can make. That the way in which Sharia has evolved to begin with, uh, this may take us in a completely different direction that, uh, uh, that I may not be willing to, to go into. But my claim is that. There is no possibility of an enacting moment of a Sharia concept of principle. That you cannot trace back any Sharia rule or principle alone to a point when it became Sharia. That the, the way in which it becomes Sharia is very spontaneous, um, sort of intergenerational, and sometimes quite mysterious. I mean, you never know really, uh, and you can't tell in advance. I mean, it's just ideas are expressed and then over time some of them stay, others are lost and that is how you get to have certain positions established and others which are lost all the time. Uh, and that is, I think, is a very wonderful and very helpful process. But the problem with it is that you cannot accelerate and you cannot uh, institutionalize. You cannot have a situation where you can have a council that declares for each other on English. Now, what does that mean for women access to religious space in mosques? What does that mean to women's access to burial sites? To part of the burial ceremony? Um, that is my intellectual conviction good enough? Is it even my ability to uh, make a uh, theoretical argument as I did regarding uh, interreligious marriage? Is that good enough? Or do we have to find a way by which that type of change can happen that can sustain the transformation of our communities despite the, the very different environment and even language. Now, we are all talking about, about this issue in English. 
and whenever they captured, uh, I have to have been raised in other language and other tradition, and uh, English can never capture the, the nuance and the, and the beauty and the wonderful uh, sort of shades of meaning that you can find in other languages. Uh, but I don't want to concede authority to Arabic uh, because that might concede authority to a, a cultural uh, tradition that we not consider the uh, So those are some of the issues that I have studied in this. This book is going probably, I hope that it will be published, and I hope it will be read and be controversial. I hope that we will, will register some more. But uh, what I want to close with is to say that it's at a very <coughs> profound personal risk for me to write this book. You know, I have written other issues, other issues. It was much easier and it was just simply related theoretical issues or, or theoretical issues. But this one, I think, got to the core of what it means to be a, a Muslim and an American Thank you very much. Now turn to Professor uh, Dr. Andrew March, who is Associate Professor in Critical Science at Yale University. Uh, he received his DPhil in politics from Oxford in 2006. And uh, we also have our postdoc to the seminar, Adam Edison, who likewise received the DPhil from Oxford. And we acknowledge Adam's help and also Josh Keaton, our uh, presently our RA, who's also a videographer. Um, so, Andrew March um, published the book Islam and Liberal Citizenship, The Search for an Overlapping Consensus, uh, which was published by Oxford in 2009, and is a recipient of the Award for Excellence in the Study of Religion from the American Academy of Religion. Um, he's published numerous articles in such journals as Political Theory, uh, the American Political Science Review, Philosophy and Public Affairs, and Social Research, among others. Current research is aimed at a number of projects related to modern Islamic political thought. Um, two examples are uh, first, modern Islamic theories of political sovereignty, particularly how they negotiate between the ideals of divine and popular sovereignty. And uh, second is uh, a study of modern Islamic justifications and characterizations of Sharia as a socio political doctrine appropriate for all times and places focusing in particular on the uses of theological anthropology and moral psychology. Both of those can be found on his website at Yale. Uh, well, I know he's an incisive critic since I was graced by his criticism when I presented a paper in the Yale Political Theory seminar recently, and we'll hear what he has to say about the uh, and the Uh, well, thank you very, very much for that warm and generous introduction. I'm very, very uh, pleased to be here. It's a real, real pleasure. Um, of course, everybody knows that Abdullahi's work has been uh, an inspiration, I guess it's an understatement, to uh, probably at least two generations of scholars now in Islamic studies and human rights. Um, he was even influential on uh, sort of John Rawls himself, capitally. Uh, so it's really uh, it's, a re it's a real pleasure to be uh, to be here this afternoon and uh, to say a few things about his forthcoming book. Um, I'm going to sort of focus my discussion on uh, six or seven concepts that were in the text that was pre-circulated. Uh, they they were not well, not all of them were discussed uh, in the preceding remarks. I'm going to say a little bit about what I take him to be saying and then just raise some questions. Um, as I see it, and, and possibly for uh, discussion. Uh, so let me just actually just introduce the concepts that I see as doing the most work here and raising the most questions. Uh, first is, well, first I sort of have two categories. One, uh, some of Abdullahi's developing views on Islam as such. And the second category is the way that he's using some of these developing theological and legal concepts to talk about the problems uh, of American Muslims. So the first, are a set of theological doctrines that he's putting forth that I want to raise a few questions about. 
Um, the second concept or category uh, is his treatment of uh, the idea of Islamic law, or the idea of Sharia, he has a, a, a developing set of ideas about what Islamic law is, uh, what it's not, what it can do, and what it can't, that are, uh, that are doing a lot of work here. Um, and it's sometimes I'm not exactly sure if I understand it uh, well enough. Uh, related to that, then, is the idea of legal pluralism in a uh, context like the United States, when he discusses the possibility of legal pluralism and distinguishes it from something like moral pluralism, a lot of that is being uh, facilitated by what he's established Islamic law to be. Uh, fourth is this idea of religious self-determination, which permeates uh, the chapter that I read, which I still think remains a little bit unclear. Uh, fifth is are some of his remarks on neutrality in the secular context, which I found to be eminently reasonable and uh, and persuasive, yet I think raised some some potentially difficult questions about some other things that he said about similar concepts in Islamic thought. Uh, six is his, is his idea of civic reason, which of course is very similar to uh, Rawlsian or Habermasian ideas of public reason or discourse. Um, and I only have a few uh, very, very brief remarks on that. And finally, uh, seventh is his conception of citizenship or active citizenship, and a number of remarks about what he thinks American Muslims ought to be doing, and implicitly uh, what they are, uh, what they're not doing. So anyway, that's actually most of what I wanted to do. I'm not going to obviously spend a lot of time on each of these concepts. So first, then, about uh, his theology. I'm a little bit uh, confused about uh, a potential paradox, or I'm concerned about a potential paradox, or I'm concerned about a tendency to want to uh, advance at times a radically individualistic conception of Islamic commitment, uh, Islamic epistemic authority, which he grounds uh, quite radically, I think, in the individual. And yet at the same time, in other contexts, Abdullah, he wants to be able to say that there are certain things which simply are facts about Islam, or simply uh, relate to the inherent nature of Sharia. So at a number of points he says that, um, although he does qualify this as saying, well, that's just my opinion, sort of an you know, almost Nietzschean style, well, you know, these are radical truths that I'm asserting with a hammer, but that's just my, that's just my view. <laughs> uh, so for example, at one, at one point he says that it's the inherent nature of Sharia to demand a secular state. Well, that's an exceptionally strong view, and uh, it can be defended, um, but I, I just wonder how it sits with some other things that he says about um, uh, it, it, it being the right of every Muslim to experience her religious beliefs according to her own convictions and choice, which is a quote from the first page. So the, uh, the obvious category of thought here is authority. Uh, now, fine if you, if you want to say that you don't believe in a strong conception of authority, and I think there's no doubt that most people that study Islamic history would say that Islam does tend I wouldn't call it the democratic, but I would say to, to, to the dispersed and anti-authoritarian uh, wing of the Abrahamic religions, uh, somewhere like certain strains of Orthodox Judaism or Protestantism, where there isn't a single hierarchical church. But that doesn't mean that there isn't authority. That doesn't mean that there aren't certain kinds of boundaries. And it doesn't mean that there aren't ways of establishing the superiority um, or the greater persuasiveness uh, of a position. Um, so, I'm not trying to accuse you of anything, but I'm just wondering how deep does this commitment go? How deep does it, I mean, are there any boundaries to what Islam is as such? Are you willing to draw any kinds of boundaries? If somebody asserts a doctrine, let's say, of pantheism, or a certain kind of doctrine uh, uh, that stresses perhaps the imminence of God in the world rather than God's transcendence or, or command uh, uh, properties and things like that, or perhaps doubts that we can know the existence of God at all. Are these the kinds of things that are also just equally up to the, to the conscience of the individual? Um, and do you mean that in an epistemic sense, or do you mean that, of course, in a political sense? If it's the second, of course, I can understand why you would say that nobody should be coerced to recant a view, or nobody should be punished for having a view. But is it also your view that there's no epistemic standpoint where we can say that a theological doctrine belongs to Islam uh, or it doesn't. Uh, so then, this leads us then to the question of uh, what is Islamic law and what is uh, Sharia. I want to just very, very quickly read two passages which I don't see, well, maybe upon rereading them I will see that I misunderstood the contradiction. Uh, so on page 37 you write, uh, 
If a human legislator wishes to punish the Sharia crime of theft or sadaqa, he must adopt the exact Sharia definition and not change any aspect of it to translate it in modern terms. Now this is an exceptionally formalist and, and, and very traditional conception of what Islamic law is. It says that to apply Islamic law is to sort of efface as much human agency as possible and to say here's a text, whether the text is revelatory or whether the text is found from a traditional legal text, and you're either applying it or you're not. Either Sharia is active or it isn't. All right, now many people think that. On 46, you go on to say, um, the third process of religious self-determination for Muslims, and a, uh, and a critically important one, is Islamic discourse on the interpretation of Sharia in the modern context. Since what Muslims uphold as Sharia today resulted from human interpretation of the Quran and Sunnah of the Prophet, that interpretation can be modified by reinterpretation of the same sources. So I'm just curious here, um, there's a lot going on in your descriptions of what Islamic law is. On the one hand, you say, the Muslim ideal of Islamic law is that God alone is ruling and God alone is legislating. But like certain paradoxes about popular sovereignty, that can't possibly exist unless you actually believe that God is physically intervening in the world in the form of miracles, parting seas, burning bushes, smiting people, and things like that. If you don't believe that, if you only believe that God has spoken through revelation, or perhaps implanted something of the spirit in communal consensus, then what is in fact happening is always human agency. Now, I find that observation, this is what you write in Islam and, and, and in the secular state, that's pretty persuasive. It's also something that's been recognized by the Islamic tradition, so it's not necessarily a reductio of the aspiration to living by Islamic law or living by God's law. So on the one hand, you, you, you say that. On the other hand, then you say that, that, um, uh, that uh, to be committed to applying Islamic, uh, Islamic law is only to be committed to, uh, to applying this text. And I see what you're trying to do there by, again, stressing human agency, but I'm not sure um, I'm not sure exactly which uh, which way you want to uh, which way you want to lean. This then leads us to the idea of, of legal pluralism. Why is legal pluralism not something that Muslims should aspire to in a country like the United States? Well, your answer largely is based on your understanding of what Islamic law is. So you say a number of things. One, well, it's not really law because law requires a certain set of things. Now, you don't use things like rules of recognition, that people need to recognize certain authorities or certain binding is that law um, is coercive, that it has statutes, that it has rules. Um, but then this leads to the, to the question of whether Islamic law has ever been law, whether uh, through its traditional application through legal schools or through courts, where uh, judges take on enormous amounts of, of interpretive authority and discretion to apply things, has Islamic law ever been law, or is it kind of a category mistake to say that it was that it was ever uh, that it was ever really applied? So, I'm also quite puzzled, I think, by the absence of the idea of contract. So, one of your main arguments as to why we can't have legal pluralism is because we don't know what Islamic law is. Either Islamic law is just what's written in the legal manuals, but this is not really applicable or nobody really knows what it is because it's subject to radical disagreement. Um, uh, and we can't expect the secular courts to be applying Islamic law because as soon as the secular court applies Islamic law, it's no longer Islamic law. It's like some kind of ontological changes happen, like the Eucharist or something, right? That, you know, that, that the law has been magically transformed into something other than God's law. But you, on my understanding, in non-Muslim context, what most people imagine is some kind of Islamo-legal zone that uh, Muslims could have sort of a standard range of marital contracts, business contracts, sales contracts, um, uh, uh, you know, perhaps things like uh, wills and, and, and things like that. And these are inspired by Islamic law. These are inspired by the classical norms. Perhaps there's a range of them. Perhaps there's different legal schools. Uh, Muslims can participate in this process of contributing to what Islamic law is in choosing. And what the secular court is doing is just enforcing a contract that we assume does not violate public policy or, or basic rights or something like that. So it strikes me that when people talk about this, the space for Islamic law in a country like the United States, 
this is what uh, most people uh, most people have in mind. Uh, moving on, then you do a uh, a really really fascinating thing with the idea of neutrality. And of course, neutrality has come under a lot of abuse, uh, a lot of it uh, quite reasonable. We can never actually live um, in a neutral sphere. We're always positing some kinds of rules that exclude uh, some points of view or some values and include others. So neutrality um, is not even something that we can make coherent sense out of and not, not to be something that we aspire to. You say, well, yeah, fine, of course, that's pretty obvious, Stanley Fish, but we can speak of certain kinds of bounded neutrality. Within this space, we can be neutral between, well, let's say specifically different religions, or we can be neutral between different sports teams, and we can aspire to something called relative neutrality. Well, that's a really interesting move. Uh, it's kind of a modest, pragmatic approach to the problem of, of liberal justification. But my question is, why couldn't we say the same thing about divine sovereignty? Divine sovereignty, of course, is subject to a lot of the same kinds of problems and paradoxes as popular sovereignty, or in, in, in different ways, the idea of neutrality, right? Uh, in, in the sense that the same charge of this thing cannot possibly exist in the political world, because what are posited to be its most important properties cannot coexist with active human agency or choosing. Well, I think what the response to your kind of very, very powerful reductio of divine sovereignty is to say, well, yes, of course, God is never perfectly sovereign in the world, but Islamic law has always recognized legal pluralism, uh, has recognized the validity of different interpretations, has recognized, and that's why there's this strong emphasis on the public nature of norm contestation. You have to give your proofs, you have to give your reasoning. So we can speak of that relative divine sovereignty. God can be more or less um, sovereign in the world based on uh, the relative distance between our actions and what we can publicly justify on the basis of revelation. So it's not to this people, just wondering whether when you sort of redeem neutrality from that, uh, that, that criticism, whether the same could not also be done with your criticism of, uh, of divine sovereignty. All right, so just to conclude then with uh, the final two points. You, you talk a lot about religious self-determination. And it's a phrase that I find very curious. And I'm wonder, I don't think you mean this, but I, I wonder whether you might be accused of um, positing a kind of a, an aspiration towards, towards sovereignty, the, the sovereign self or a sovereign community, which is to say, you know, Muslims are a certain way, or Muslims have various more authentic ways of expressing themselves politically and less authentic ways. And we don't necessarily know this in advance, but the aspiration is to some kind of, of authentic uh, Muslim self-determination. And um, I think that, I, uh, maybe that, that's fleshed out in the rest of the chapters, but I'm curious, uh, the, the self-determination is independence from what? Is it what kinds of heteronomy is, is this determination supposed to be uh, an emancipation from? Is it, you know, you mentioned a couple of things, right? This idea that we have to just please non-Muslims, but also that we can never be seen to be pleasing non-Muslims. But I'm curious, uh, I'm curious also, uh, I'm sort of hungry for, for some more details. But what does this look like? When you talk about this active citizenship, what exactly do you mean? Do you want more lobbying groups? Do you want more public interest groups? Uh, a number of times you said that Muslims need to claim the rights of citizenship through some kind of active involvement. But, uh, but, but you know, what more do you mean than you know, voting, uh, uh, building civil society, claiming legal rights, uh, and things like that? I think that's where I'll, I'll stop at this point. Thank you very much.